We have now arrived into chapter four, and we're going to talk about two concepts that are related. One is called interpolation, and the other one is called numerical differentiation. Both of these techniques are going to use what we call differences, and we'll even generalize finite differences into something we'll call divided differences. In the case of interpolation, we'll assume that we don't have a nice formula for the function. But what we do have is a table of x and y values. We'll assume there's some spacing, usually even spacing, between the x values, and the y's are the actual functional uh, evaluations of each x value. Now, we may end up having a fairly coarse table, and we'd like to look in between, like halfway between two x values, or maybe a third of the way between them. And we'll use a method called interpolation to do that. The next topic will be numerical differentiation. It's quite related, and in the case of differentiation, we will ask what is the slope between two adjacent points. We will also use the actual method for derivatives and higher order derivatives as we face differential equations in chapter seven. So these are the topics we are covering in section 4.1, but without any further ado, let's just get straight into them and see what we can say about Lagrange interpolation. So we will be introducing a concept called divided differences, and we will be creating polynomial approximations of an underlying function for which we only know distinct values. Let's start with the easy one, the one that you're already used to, that you've had for years, and that's called linear interpolation. We're first going to look at this from the perspective of a qualitative approach, or maybe an intuitive approach, to how we would look at in-between values on a table. And then we will develop it more analytically using a Taylor approximation. Suppose we have a list of table values that start with x1. Uh, we may have x1 and x2 and x3, uh, and we have y values that correspond to those x values. Now that's pretty coarse grid. You know, these, these points, the x1 and the x2 are the known points, and they're separated by an entire unit, and we may want to take a look at what's going on at a point in between, say x equals 1.3. The approach we're going to use, or the philosophical approach, is that as our interpolated value gets closer and closer to one of the tabled values, it should be more strongly influenced by that table value. And the same thing should happen if that point were very close to, uh, to the other tabled value. Uh, it should be influenced more heavily by that functional value. A way to do that is to look at how far away x is from each of its neighboring tabled values and take a ratio, the distance that x is from x to, and divide it by the entire interval itself. Now, as x is getting closer to x1, the distance x is from x2 is getting larger, and the ratio of x minus x2 to x1 minus x2 should be approaching unity. Let's create a formula for that. Uh, I can take x2 minus x, this distance here, and divide it by the entire uh, distance, and if I multiply that ratio by f of x1, well then this number is going to be pretty big, compared to its neighbor, which will be x minus x1, divided by the same interval. Now I like that formula because as x gets further and further away from x2, well it's getting closer and closer to x1. And so this fraction will be closer to unity, while this fraction will be closer to zero, thus giving me the correct influence that I'm going for between f of x1 and f of x2 when forming f of x. That's all intuitive. It seems to make sense. It works nicely. There's not a whole lot of math behind it. It's a little bit of arm waving, but intuitively, I like it. And so it'd be nice if we could develop this thing in a little more concrete manner. But before we do, I need to rearrange the terms just a bit without changing the actual formula. 
Here we have the same formula that we had at the bottom of the last page. What I want to do is switch these two around. I want to take x1 minus x2. Well, if I'm going to do that, then I better do the same thing to the numerator so that the sign doesn't change on this ratio. And that should do nothing at all to the formula. One more step that I need to make, and that is I need to rename x1 to x0 and x2 to x1. Well, that does absolutely nothing at all, provided I change consistently x1 to x0 and x2 to x1 everywhere in the formula. But since my algorithms are going to start with x0 typically, I just like this form better. So there's really no change here whatsoever. Now I would like to be a bit more analytic and give a less heuristic approach to developing this interpolation formula. And we need to go back to our old friend, the Taylor series, and look at an expansion of our function up to a linear term. So we've seen this plenty of times before. f of x can be approximated uh, by f of x0 and a deviation of x minus x0 times the first derivative evaluated at x0. So this is not new at all. Well, what do we do with this derivative? That's a little bit trickier because we don't have the function. We just have table entries. Well, if we have table entries, those could be the basis of approximating this slope as being the rise over the run of two adjacent values near x0. So here's the rise and here's the run. And that should be approximately equal to my f prime of x. So we can approximate the slope at x0 as being the rise over the run of the two closest points I can get to x0. We can now plug f prime of x0 back into this expression and we end up getting the formula on the following page. Let's take one more step and multiply f of x0 by this same term that we have in the denominator. If we did that we can combine these terms into a single numerator divided by a single denominator. Now we can multiply this all out and see if anything cancels. So I'll distribute f of x0 through this difference and in this case, I'll end up with four terms when I get all my cross products. So here they are. You can check that later and see that these are all the six terms associated with these multiplications. But we do have some cancellation. Minus x0 times f of x0 will cancel plus x0 f of x0. So let's get rid of those two and simplify this a bit. The other thing that we will now do is combine our f of x0 terms together and our f of x1 terms together. And when we do that, we get a deviation of x1 from x that came from these two terms multiplied by f of x0, and we'll get a deviation of x with x0 times f of x1, uh, which formed this term here. Let's separate them back again. So let's take this expression divided by x1 minus x0 and the second expression also by x, divided by x1 minus x0. And on that first term, we'll just turn them around like we did last time, and that will end up forming the Lagrange equation that we looked at earlier. This is called our first order linear interpolation. We ended up de deriving this this time a little more analytically rather than just somewhat uh, intuitively. And if we wanted to, we could add an error term to this too because the, the error term from the Taylor series could have been carried through this thing as well. Now there is a section in your book that covers the error associated with the Lagrange method. We aren't going to use that because we want to get on to differentiation a little bit faster, but you should know that the error associated with it with this can be bounded. There he is. Here's the guy that did it. Uh, he looks a little sad about it, maybe because it got too complex, or maybe because he didn't think he was finished. And, and I don't think we're finished either, because you may want to have a more sophisticated interpolation than just a linear one. And Dr. Lagrange uh, did that for us. We won't go through all the derivation, but if you did the same thing with the Taylor series and went out one more term, you would find that you could develop a new interpolation uh, formula that used three points rather than two.
and this would form a quadratic interpolation. Why? Because if you multiplied all this out, you're going to get x squared terms, and you're going to get linear, linear terms and constant terms. So you're really forming a polynomial in this interpolation method. Here I want you to look closely at the form. This looks just like what we did before. If you take f evaluated at x0, the coefficient in front of f of x0 will not involve x0 on the numerator at all. It will be all the deviations except x0. And then if you copied the numerator and formed the denominator from it, replacing x with x0, you would get the denominator. So if you take the numerator as it is and form the denominator from it, replacing the x values with the argument of f of x1, then you will get the denominator here as well. And the same thing with the third term. And this ends up generalizing into any size polynomial that you would like. Here is a cubic interpolation. Same thing happens. You evaluate f of x0 and you take the, the numerator as the differences of every other point except x0. And then you copy the numerator to the denominator, replacing x with x0, and that forms your coefficient f of x0. And you do the identical thing at x1, x2, and x3. And this would form a cubic, which gives you potentially more accuracy in the interpolation. This cubic interpolation has a direct analogy into what's called a cubic spline fitting. And that is covered in Chapter 6 of your book. We will not be covering it in this course. Uh, it is a, a very widely used procedure in geometric uh, curve fitting, uh, but, you'll, but you'll have to take that from another course. If you want to generalize this to any size polynomial, uh, we just replace these products with, with product signs. Or if you would like to write this more compactly and use the summation sign, this all fits into a nice clean formula that might give you heartburn looking at it, but at least it's, it's straightforward and you can write it down for any size polynomial that you want. Let's look at one example, and this example will be useful when you get to your homework. Uh, this is a three-point table. So we have x0, x1, and x2. And we want to set up an interpolation formula that is based on a second order polynomial. So you just plug it in like you like the formula says to, take deviations from every point except the one that you're evaluating at. So two is the functional value, it goes here. And you do it for each of the three points that you have to work with. So take a look at that and I think that will be a fairly straightforward example which you can use on your homework that we won't assign until next time. So this brings us to the end of section 4.1a. We'll look at 4.1b next time in which we look at Newton's version of the exact same thing. It's a little more abstract as we would expect out of Newton, but it's also simpler and easier to form. And then we'll have a homework that allow you to do both the Lagrange approach and the Newton approach. We'll see you next time.